Hello everyone, welcome back to the analyst for 28th August 2024 where we will be discussing 9 most important articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express. In the very first article, we will be looking into the various aspects of Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana and the broader government agenda of financial inclusion in the country. In the second article, we will be looking into a very important treaty in current affairs that is High Seas Treaty. In the third article, we will be looking into the broader aspects of care ecosystem also that is known as care economy. In the fourth article, we will be looking into the various aspects of right to strike and the related rights in our country. In the fifth article, we will be looking into the various aspects of GST and some of the issues which are ongoing. In the last part, we will be discussing some of the most important prelims snippets where we will be covering news in shorts which will be very important for your prelims examination. So stay tuned. So students welcome to the very first article where we will be talking about financial inclusion and uh, here we have an editorial which is talking about the success and the overall agenda that should be associated with the Pradhan Mantri Jan Dhan Yojana which is a very important financial inclusion scheme in the country. So we will be looking into it, we will be also looking into the various other initiatives and other some of the challenges coming out of the financial inclusion imperatives in the country. Now this is a very important part of the syllabus when we concern about prelims, we have the economic and social development inclusive part here. Also when we talk about GS3, we have the term inclusive growth and the various issues arising from the same. Now, in this particular question, we have to understand that inclusive growth and financial inclusion are closely interlinked because we have to understand whenever we talk about financial inclusion, it is actually according to the Committee on Financial Inclusion by Rangarajan, it is actually the process of ensuring financial access to the various types of financial services and also ensuring adequate credit whenever the vulnerable groups such as weaker sections and the low income groups are needing any kind of credit, any kind of deposit facilities by the bank at a very affordable cost. So this is actually a broader paradigm of inclusive growth. When we talk about inclusive growth, right, is actually the growth which is taking all of the sections of the population irrespective of their classes together along with the economic growth of the country. So if we can tell that this is the inclusive growth, financial inclusion is a subset of inclusion growth. Now because we have to understand for inclusive growth we need all of the sections of the population to grow equally and if we understand the main economic agenda is actually to ensure growth to, uh, to, to actually have more and more development in the country, to have more and more bank accounts, to have more and more business, startups, investments and so on. So this is actually be possible through financial inclusion. And we understand there are many unbanked or unserved sections of the populations in the country. They can be understood using a stakeholder analysis. Stakeholders means who are the stakeholders for which whom we need inclusive growth. These are for example the women, these are rural laborers, these are for example migrant workers, these are senior citizens. Right? Like accordingly, there are many sections of the populations which need special focus when it comes to financial inclusion. So that is why we have to understand these are the people who are underserved or unserved. That means they perhaps maybe do not have a bank account. Even if they have, they do not maybe do not know how to use it. Maybe they are not having full say access to the financial services. So this is what we understand that there are the many sections or there are the many people in the country who are unserved and we have to include them in the banking system of the country. How? By say opening bank accounts for them, by including them under microfinance institutions so that they can get small loans for setting up small businesses for example the self-help groups in the rural areas. Then for example we have to provide them with banking access using mobile phone internet connectivity, say proper amount of applications or mobile apps or net banking, we have to educate them. So this is how we will be bridging the gap by for example doing more things such as giving credit card, postal networks such as postal banks in the country which are located at the postal offices in the nation such as uh, financial cooperatives such as the cooperative banks. So we understand that these are the people who are disconnected from the banking system right and we have to include them. How? By uh, you, you know uh, promoting the savings habit between them by say promoting Jandhan accounts where every individual is say 
encouraged to open bank accounts and also get some benefits associated with those kind of accounts right we can have payment facilities insurance facilities and various other uh, you know uh, amenities when these people are included in the banking system financial inclusion is also a very very say important core theme of the sustainable development goal where various goals such as you know no poverty zero hunger good health and well-being gender equality decent working economic conditions industry and infrastructure and also reduced inequalities these goals can be fulfilled if we have financial inclusion and a very good case study here that is being presented in this editorial is the case of Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana. Now, let me tell you, as of 2011, right, 2011 almost, say 13, 14 years ago, half of India did not even have formal banking facilities. Formal banking facilities means like having a bank account, having a net banking account, having a proper savings account, current account and so on. So half of India did not have that because we understand in the country right we have many sections of the populations who are not say accessible have do not have any access to this kind of financial services so that is why in 2014 the government of india introduced a very very important scheme you all must have heard about it i am you know very sure of it this is the pradhan mantri jandhan yojana to have a target of achieving 7.5 crore indians right to be included in the banking system and this is a very very important goal of integration you know the banking system why we know from our macroeconomic concepts from money and banking we know that the more money if the money of the people is kept with the bank accounts the more money that is kept in the banks in the banking system the greater the banks can give loans for example to us for example to investors for example to any other business households now these business people or say any other households they can take the loans from the banks and they can invest and set up a new factory right can say expand their own branches and they can create more and more employment just because of what just because of some people who are depositing money in the banks because banks will be using the money that is deposited for credit creation and this is helping the economy to create more and more loans create more and more investments and so on this is actually one more aspect of money multiplier money multiplier increases when the banking habits of population of the people in the country they develops the banking habits means just depositing your money in the bank rather than keep, keep, keeping cash with yourself or say not keeping uh, say uh, uh, ideal money that you have at your home at the bank account so this is where we have to understand this and by by say uh, having a Pradhan Mati Jandhan account any person will be also having insurance coverage in terms of various accidents in terms of life term and so on it the person can also have overdraft facility even for example a person has 2000 rupees in her bank account she can use for example say up to 3000 rupees say taking 1000 rupees as overdraft facility this means that the banks can give you sometimes a little more money so that you can meet some of your immediate temporary expenses later you can actually pay the money back so it is kind of a loan you can just uh, talk about and here this Jandhan accounts are also linked with reference to the various direct benefit transfers in the country. Now, can in, can you in the comment section, can you give me some examples of schemes, uh, two, three examples of scheme, which takes the help of direct benefit transfer. These particular government schemes, they help the people to get the money in their bank accounts directly. Then finally, if the people are having bank account, they obviously will be using UPI payments, right? So the digital transactions will be increasing over a period of time as we have seen right now particularly after demonetization after the covid pandemic we have seen that the digital transactions have increased thousand times in the country when we talk about 2011 levels right so the people in in india right now and also if you see you if, if you go at any local grocery stores if you go anywhere in the country almost anywhere you will be seeing qr codes where you can make easily QR, you know uh, uh, payments how this is possible because of jandan accounts right and here if we can look at some of the important data that you can use in your means right so as of now we have to understand for the 2025 financial year the target is opening 3 crore accounts going forward and uh, let me tell you 66 percent of the total jandhan accounts are opened in the rural and the semi 
urban areas that means more and more of the rural people are also benefiting from them right and we also find that almost 53 crores of the say accounts here are operative that means people are actively using the accounts and here let me tell you the total accounts are around 173 and out of this 53 crores are actually being operative now this is actually a challenge rather than a say success because you have to understand less than say 50 percent people are actually using them on a day-to-day -day basis but apart from that there is around 2.3 lakh crores of jandan deposits in the bank system so this is leading to more and more credit creation this is actually good for the economy over a long period of time also if you look at the average balance that you know say the bank holders are keeping in the jandan accounts is around 4352 rupees that has actually increased from around 1000 rupees in 2015 right now it is say 2024 and it is around at 4352 rupees it has actually increased the most special aspect of jandan account is actually that 55 percent 55 percent of the accounts belong to women and this is actually a very very important aspect because we understand that in the rural areas we find there is an increasing trend of feminization of agriculture where more and more agriculture laborers are turning, turning out to be female because the male are actually going out to work migration and uh, you know various other reasons so for them we need proper amount of jandan accounts we already have seen that majority of the accounts are in the rural and semi-urban areas and out of this we find that more than 50 percent belong to the women and also we find that 8.4% of the Jandan accounts have zero balance account. That means these accounts do not need any maintenance balance and so on. And also over a period of time, as we have seen from 2017, as recently as 2017, right, according to RBI's financial inclusion index, a very, very important index, it has shown that over a period of time, the index has you know improved consistently right though we had a you know small increase in 2020-21 the covid pandemic years but we find that right now it is also consistently increasing over a period of time that means that there are various other initiatives apart from this that is actually helping including the or say increasing the financial inclusion in the country firstly we have credit guarantee schemes for msmes we know msmes as micro small medium enterprises which are which are accountable for you know majority of the manufacturing production majority almost you know a, a good amount of exports of our country and these are the people who need these are the industries who need a lot of money over a short period of time right so that is why the government of india is giving various amount of credit or say loans and for any loan to be taken by any business for for example even us we need to give some security so in this particular say initiative the security is given by the government as a guarantee so the msmes can have collateral free or security free loans and not to worry about any security so they have to just pay interest and even interest is at a discounted rate or that is known as interest subvention next we have the Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana again a very very important initiative to promote more and more MSMEs by actually classifying the various enterprises into Kishore and Shishu categories where based on their size they will be getting various financial incentives by the government of India next there are some rural focused areas right and also some of the important schemes firstly we have the RRBs, the regional rural banks. We have the various primary credit societies or say cooperative societies at the very local levels. We have the various bank accounts or, 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 or the various banks such as the small finance banks, the payment banks where they have to keep a certain amount of their branches in the rural areas. We have also bank mitras or banking correspondents who are actually not an employee of the banks but rather a liaison or uh, say a friend of the bank who is trying to promote banking facilities to the rest of the population rest of the people say in a village in a district and so on we also have more and more ATMs which are opening in the banks right now so this is actually bringing the banks more closer to the people and improving the banking habit of the people next we also have a very very important scheme which is actually you know uh, uh, say encouraged or say inspired from the Grameen Bank model of Bangladesh which is known as SSG bank linkage where various SSGs will be having bank linkages for example ICIC, HDFC and so on they will be partnering and tying up with various SSGs and giving them loans as a whole right means uh, there, there are many members in the SSG so all of the members will be having the benefit of getting loans from the banks directly then we have the Kisan credit card to up to a particular limit the 
farmers in the country they can use the credit cards to spend on their agriculture expenses and the various other expenses too then we have the digital payment promotion as of now right we have upi we have various amounts of fintech companies which are operating good amount of incentives for digital transactions in, in, in you know in the country then we have rbi's project financial literacy and sebi's you know pocket money which is actually linked to increasing the financial awareness or financial education in the nation then we also have the priority sector lending where the scheduled commercial banks and the foreign banks in the country they have to lend 40% of their entire portfolio to for example say women to for example say various priority sectors of the country rural development and so on so this is a very very important that where 40% of the overall funds or the loans lend level funds they must be given to the priority sectors and also for the small finance banks that is actually 75% pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana is a very very important insurance scheme where the scope of coverage or say the people who will be coverage is having is a people who will be having a savings bank account who is between the 18 to 15 years old the benefit is that 2 lakh is payable on the members debt to any reason and there is a small premium very nominal premium per year that is 330 rupees that will be auto debited from the people's bank account that can be a jandhan account that can be any other account so this is also increasing the insurance penetration in the country next we also have a very important scheme for women for sc for st communities to promote more and more entrepreneurship by taking loans from the government at say very low interest rate which is known as stand up india and finally in this list we have the pradhan mantri vaya vandana yojana which is a very important scheme targeted at the elderly population by improving their lives and also giving them in a, you know uh, various uh, 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 say incentives in their elderly life apart from this in the comment section can you let me two three more important financial uh, say inclusion schemes in the country now after this we'll be looking into the various existing challenges we know in our country we have around right a rough figure of around 1/4 of the population is illiterate and also poor so they do not have a proper education proper amount of awareness of the various benefits they will be getting into the financial system also we have seen that out of around 170 crore accounts right we have only 53 crore accounts which are operative so many people are not using it despite being signing on the particular aspect of jandhan accounts then we also have various integration issues with reference to jam jam stand for jandhan account aadhar system and mobile so there are various technical issues for example say the aadhar card is outdated maybe the address is wrong maybe the phone number is not updated there are many issues in this particular network so that issue is still there which is also leading to the exclusion of some people from getting the benefits of direct benefit transfer sometimes it has been seen it has also been reported in the news many times next we also have this issue of digital divide in the country where we understood according to oxfam digital divide report 2000 22 right the number of people with mobile phone in the country right uh, say with reference to female is 69.25 and with reference to male is around 38% right also when we talk about say people who are having no computers or laptop it is more prevalent between say uh, 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 you know almost 97% of the country both male and female do not have any laptop computer and it if you look at the mobile phone part female people are not having this particular provision so digital divide particularly in rural india is also very very high then we also see the rising amount of frauds with reference to identity theft market fraud various amount of third party fraud say various scams call centers and so on these are targeting some poorer people in the country and leading a loss of financial uh, 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 say issues next there are some banks who also include some of the hidden charges to increase their profits so this is also disadvantaging some people to open bank accounts then there is rising amount of non performing assets or the loans for example the people have taken and not able to pay back so that is also increasing and this is also leading some banks not to be very encouragative sometimes to open jandhan accounts and say various other financial inclusion initiatives and also we have seen that there is a gender inequity when it comes to the distribution of various amounts of financial inclusion in the in, in initiatives in the country now the path ahead the road is firstly we have to understand we 
the we, we cannot only blame the government for everything right we have to also take the private sector together now in this aspect also we have seen the private sector is doing also a very good job be it ptm be it phone pay be it the various fintech companies who are now right now also signing up banks on a digital platform a mobile platform via digital kyc they are also offering various services such as blockchain services regulation biotech uh, say uh, various amounts of say biometric ids cloud services e wallets mobile wallets and so on so the fintech so financial technology sector is actually pro, uh, progressing on over a long period of time also we need more and more gender inclusive financial initiatives such as stand up india and various other programs we also need to avoid over indebtedness among new account holders to decrease the amount of non performing assets over a period of time so new account holders they must be taught how to take loans they must be made financially disciplined and also in this particular aspect recently rbi's unified lending interface is very important when we talk about say reducing the indebtedness and also this thing has been covered in the recent analyst can you let me know in the comment what is this all about next we also need better amount of consumer protection and regulatory framework by the government of india by actually looking into various scams frauds and having proper amount of regulation on them and finally we need better customer centric product design of various loans schemes policies insurance programs so that people can be having greater benefit over this kind of aspects now with reference to this topic we have had questions in 2016 and 2022 in the mains and also as you know mains is approaching that is why you need to also look at the pyqs and based on the discussion you please let me know in the comments what do you think can be added to this kind of questions to get more and more extra marks all the things that we have discussed here please you try to incorporate the various value addition that we have discussed in this kind of questions in the next article we'll be looking into the high seas treaty because recently india is set to sign the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction agreement also known as bbnj also known as high seas treaty now this is a very important topic for your prelims where we have general issues on environment ecology and climate change and also for gst where we have to look at the various conservation environmental pollution and degradation aspect now when we talk about the high seas high seas they make about 2/3 of the entire world's ocean and they represent around 95% of the earth's total habitat generally the seas for example that has been designated in this particular graph so if you look at it high seas are actually the areas away from the exclusive economic zones which we'll be looking in the next slide so these are the areas where we do not have any country having any exclusive rights on this particular seas or the resources below the seas so that is why we need an ocean treaty also apart from this we have had many issues occurring in the oceans of our country for example the marine pollution for example say issues of climate change and the marine heat waves the extreme weather events say for example so the loss of biodiversity with reference to lot of say loss of lives to whales and the various marine creatures so we need we, we actually have various issues for exactly these kind of reasons we need this ocean treaty where recently the un member states in the last year 2023 they agreed to have a legal framework now this legal framework will be doing what it will be protecting the high seas having some good amount of set guidelines having some good amount of legally binding rules and regulations at the international and the national levels having good amount of protection for the various conservation efforts of various sensitive ecologically areas in the you know ocean we also need to protect the various species and also we have to reduce the amount of pollution so this is why this particular treaty has been designed and this will be looking into protecting 30% of the overall ocean by 2030 this is also known as 30 into 30 target and here we already have a particular legislation or say an international convention which is known as United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea 1982 which is actually a very broad kind of an aspect which is trying to cover the various areas of the say territorial waters exclusive economic zones and so on but it is not having any provision for the conservation and sustainable use of various oceanic resources beyond the national jurisdictions so this is why we need a comprehensive international agreement for ensuring this status and bbnj was actually started in 2018 when the negotiation started at the united nations
nations where the main aspect the main debate all around the world was about how the benefits of the various resources can be shared between the developed and developing countries if at all a high seas treaty would come into place because we know we can get many resources from the ocean not only fishing but also deep sea mines and deep sea polymetallic nodules and various amounts of resources from the ocean so how they will be shared and also if there is a particular treaty the various aspects of environmental impact assessment or say the various projects say crude oil projects over the sea or see the oceans fishing activities how they should be carried on what is the overall effect that they are having on environment so these are the various negotiations that took place and also to frame something which we know as marine protected areas now marine before discussing marine protected areas we have to first discuss about the various maritime zones now we know that we have you know the land boundary of any nation of any any nation in the country for example imagine that this is the coast of chennai right so from the coast of chennai which is actually we have various ponds we have various am amounts of say internal waters there right so from this particular we will be having a baseline where we will be having the last amount beat of chennai and from here to around to uh, 24 you know to 12 12 nautical miles here we have the territorial sea right from the baseline that is from chennai to 24 nautical miles we have the you know contagious zone from say this particular baseline to around uh, 200 nautical miles we have exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf of the various nations can vary from various countries uh, according to the various geographies but beyond 200 nautical miles we have the high seas and these were the high seas which we are talking about now in the comment section can you let me know what is the measure of one nautical miles in kilometers right you let me know in the comments and here we have to understand that these are the high seas which are actually not under the jurisdiction of any country and also whatever activity is taking place there right so that is highly not regulated and also we find that there are various uh, say areas various various uh, say areas over the ocean of our world for example say the nine areas for example sargasso sea lost city thermal dome so there are various valves range and various other as you can see in this map here please do look at the location of each and every location here so these are very uh, say becoming over a period of time exploitative and because of the various human activities anthropological activities so these areas need high amount of conservation right now and this is why the key provision one of the most key important key provision here is to have marine protected areas where the you know particular nations who are member to this particular treaty who will be identifying designating and managing these areas for conservation aspect and not for exploitation aspect for example say not conducting fishing activities or say regulated fishing regulated mining and say regulated exploration aspects in this particular you know a location because these are the areas which are highly sensitive and not at all protected by any nation so this is where we have this aim of protecting 30% of the ocean right by 2030 now in the next provision we have this marine genetic resources so these are the various four say uh, pillars of this treaty so we have discussed the first one right then the second one is the marine genetic resources firstly we understand we are getting many say resources from the ocean and these resources can be very useful in the metallic industry in the pharmaceutical industry in the biotechnology industry of the nation or also of the entire world so that is why we find that this particular marine genetic resources they must be shared equally between the various nations and this is where we understand this benefit sharing right now is not happening mainly there is accruing to prosperous nations such as us uk russia and so on where using their capital they are able to explore and export the resources but the developing nations and the small island nations they do not always get the benefits so developing nation the small island nations they also be have to be kept in mind according to the treaty here next environment impact assessment for the very first time right on the high seas have been proposed where with reference to any project on the high seas right we have to screen that project we have to look into the various aspects the details of what is that project we have to looking into the broader scoping or what is the environmental harm that project will be 
costing to the entire ocean. Next, we'll be having an assessment and evaluation by various parties, also the various public and the various aspects of say government, international NGOs, organizations, they'll be looking into the project, studying in scrutiny and finally if the project is approved it will be managed and reviewed from time to time so proper amount of environmental impact assessment has been proposed where along with standards along with guidelines these these will be ensuring that any planned human activities such as fishing mining exploding crude oil resources in the high seas they have minimal impact on wildlife and the ecosystem and also there will be capacity building and technology transfer aspects here where actually to support developing nations uh, in implementation of this particular high seas treaty the developing nations need more and more funds need more and more money so that particular aspect must also be developed also developing nations need better technology and better amount of resources which must be shared from the developed nation so this is also an important part but apart from this we have to understand this is still a treaty that is still in its uh, in its consultants and uh, you know it has not been formalized yet and this is why there are some challenges according to various environmental activists and also the various experts in the environmental field and the marine economy so this is where we have to understand firstly the details of the contentious provisions is still not clear contentious provisions such as environmental impact assessment because here the eia has to be done by the companies the big companies who will be exploring the mineral resources so maybe they will be having some tie with the government say with international agencies so that is one of the issues that is still need to be worked out about the sharing of benefits how it will be shared who will be sharing which country will be giving how much money right funds they are not yet clear next the mechanism for policing the protecting areas how they will be protected how much area what is the border what is the various say role of the neighboring nations for example if we have to protect the sargasso sea here what is the role of us what is the role of mexico what is the role of say for example the you know the western western european nations or african nations so these roles have to be properly defined next projects that are assessed to be heavily polluting for example if you see there are many uh, say heavily polluting industries for example the shipping industry which leave plastic heavy metal hazardous chemical leaked fuel all around the ocean in you know in, in this particular condition you know how they will be addressed how the West will be recovered, how their particular nations and the companies will be held accountable, that is also not clear yet. Another most important issue is how the resolves uh, or, or say how the disputes that is happening between the various countries over the high seas, they will be resolved. So will there be any, uh, say any international mechanism at the UN or there will be another body which will set up, that is also not clear. right? And ratification by all of the nations have not been easy as we have also seen in the case of UNCLOS, right? as we have discussed earlier. UNCLOS is also not fully ratified by the United States which is the, large, you know, the most powerful country in the entire world. So if these kind of countries are not signing up, right? we have signed up recently, we have actually declared in July only. But if some of the big developed nations, they do not come on board, then the purpose is just worthless. And also the treaty does not overrule authorities which are already looking at some of the existing uh, say uh, 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 matters with reference to high seas. For example, the International Maritime Organization is looking at the shipping uh, aspect over of the or, you know over the entire oceans of the world. International Seabed Authority is looking at the sea mining. There are regional fishing management organizations which is looking at the fishing aspects. So how this treaty will be coordinating, right? This is also not clear yet because these people, these organizations maybe will be say exercising their own independent powers and they will be clashing with the high seas treaty. And also here we have various activities such as military activities and existing fishing and commercial activities which are also exempt. So if we want to have a comprehensive treaty, also we have seen that 33% of the global fish stocks are already overfished due to commercial fishing. So if we have to have a comprehensive treaty here, we need to look at the challenges and also incorporate these in the particular final treaty. So this is what we have to discuss about this entire issue and here is a practice question for you all that is about that biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction is about acknowledging that ocean is not a limitless resource and it requires global cooperation to use the ocean sustainably command so you let me know what you think about this because recently we have signed to become a part of this treaty and in the comments you can let me know some two three points more that you can actually advocate 
when we have to include the rest of the world in this treaty. In the third article, we'll be looking into the care ecosystem or the care economy of the country, where we have to understand according to this very beautiful editorial, for women to participate in the economy, their care responsibilities need to shift elsewhere. That means that the burden of caring and also the burden for you know various household, household activities are falling undisproportionately on women. And this is a very important topic for UPSC prelims where we have to look at economic and social development and also for GST where we have to look at inclusive growth again in this particular topic. Now, care ecosystem if you have to define it comprehensively or we can also talk it as a care economy, it refers to the interconnected network of individuals, organizations and resources that provide care and support to individual members and families. Some of the examples here are hospitals, clinics, doctors, nurses and other professionals. So these are actually well recognized. But there are some other people who also attribute to care economy and say maintaining a good amount of overall social well-being physical well-being and mental well-being of the people via social workers, community workers, mental health support, experts and other needs. We also have family members, we also have friends, volunteers who also contribute voluntarily to the welfare of the people, particularly for the elderly sections of the population where their own family members, some of these uh, old age homes, they take care of the people. Next, we also have various technology involved such as telehealth or wearable devices which can be helping in the case of say a care economy. And also we have various government rules and policies also which are actually a part of this say care ecosystem. Now, we have to understand in India, right, we are expected to have 300 million elderly people by 2050. That is 30 years from now, it will be you know, increasing to 300 million people by 2050, right? Elderly population in India as of 2020 level is was around 134 million people. And this is actually more than the say current size or current population of Mexico or Russia. So we have a huge number of people who will be getting old even in the future years, right? And also we have to understand that India's 12 million population of 80 plus right now is equal to the total population of countries such as say Belgium, Greece or Cuba and also this is not a bad thing right obviously we understand that elderly individuals are not too much productive economically that is they cannot take part in economic activities by working uh, and so on obviously because they have worked all of their lives and right now they need a decent quality of life in the, as a retirement life but when they are in a retirement phase that means this is an economic opportunity for various types of companies who will be catering to their retirement life goals and aspirations for example they would require physiotherapists they would require doctors nurses counselors caretakers or you know old age homes and this will be creating various job opportunities for the elderly population. It will be creating various research and development of, of their various goods and services, right? Such as say geriatric uh, wearables, health monitoring devices, super specializations in medicine, various legal, various financial products. So it is actually an entire ecosystem where the market, it is actually to be valued at around $42 billion by 2028. Right, and as of two thousand, you know, two thousand twenty-one, this is what we know as silver economy, the economy which is catering to the elderly individuals. It is valued at you know twenty-five point seven billion dollars, and here we understand twenty percent of the overall population will be say uh, uh, reaching say elderly age by 2050 and this is where we find that this is having a good potential for various economic activities too. So this is where we have to understand the importance of monetizing, monetizing this care economy. Before that we will be discussing some of the issues firstly and also this particular silver economy, care economy, the importance of the same is what was highlighted in 1995 as a part of Beijing platform for action. So in your main answers, do not forget to use these kinds of international initiatives and forums. Now, as of now, we have seen that there is huge potential in this particular economy. But what is the issue right now is that most of the care burden is falling on the women. We find that in India, we have already low female labor force participation rate. And here, the one of the main important reasons as we also can see from this PLFS report is that th almost around 32 percent of the women are you know or say female are in the labor force and here most of them are self-employed now let us leave them apart as of now 
if we look at the females outside the labor force we find that they are attending domestic duties only what are domestic duties you can understand right catering to household needs caring for their members caring for the elderly so we understand 34 percent of the female and we understand that these are the services that can be easily be monetized because it is having some economic potential but they are not getting paid for that because they are just expected to do this activity right apart from this we find that there are various other uh, female in the labor force who are not actually in the you know uh, formal labor force are working as domestic health workers right we also have various you know female who have attended educational institutes and some other 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 aspects but we have to understand these are unpaid helpers in the uh, you know household enterprises that means in the households they spend the female they spend three times more activities than men when it comes to caring for their family such as child care care for elderly sick and disabled family members and also maintaining household course so the burden of responsibility is very very high as we already know that right this is why this is also leading to their very low amount of labor force participation also we understand the small industries right they are already small in number and they are actually a part of informal sector so they do not generally give any social security benefits to the women employees and also they are also deprived of various maternity benefit initiatives which are actually a part of very uh, you know prominent corporate uh, sectors right so these are also one of the reasons why the uh, women in our country they are not being included in this particular sector next we also have this ingrained amount of patriarchy in the indian society very regrettably very sadly right still that is going on and and that is why the societal attitude or say societal perspective is that women is actually expected to do this, uh, to, to do uh, care activities to do this kind of uh, say aspects from their own responsibility without any expectation of any payment but in return they are actually serving the global you know the, the, the overall indian gdp so this is what is a very important issue next also we find that various, there are various challenges faced by the domestic workers be the very low wages be the security of their say uh, work so that is also very low and that is why we need a comprehensive care system in the country we have to start with the child right where recently the government of india has announced mission uh, portion 2.0 and turning the existing anganwadis 2 lakh anganwadis to saksham anganwadi we know anganwadis are actually very primary centers where uh, you know pregnant women and also newborn children and their mothers they go they go for various primary healthcare services various uh, say uh, skilling uh, aspects and so on so the government is actually trying to transform them by improving the nutritional norms standards in the anganwadis right also quality uh, of meals take home ration has been strengthened and also reinforcement of better food habits so this is actually leading to a good aspect in the future that is centered with the child next also we understand that there are various states in the countries who are setting up community creches so where the mothers they can keep their children in the creches and they can go to work also there is high amount of focus on the domestic workers uh, 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 we must be trying to train them we must be having the uh, proper amount of human minimum wages for them must be also trying to skill them right also we have to understand the supply and demand gap in this particular care economy where we have some projections that over a period of time this economy will be increasing due to increasing amount of elderly people right so this is where we have to understand how we can allocate the various sections of the populations when we can actually try to monetize it and also we have to also have some amounts of policy imperatives and what are the various policy issues and the training needs for example we have to have a proper amount of domestic workers sector skill council healthcare sector skill council and national skill development corporation initiatives that are actually coordinated with this care ecosystem then a committee can be formed where the ministries of women health labor skill can be included to look into the working of this economy and finally according to world economic forum future of care economy there is a huge potential in the country and according to it we must be trying to monetize in you know the uh, care economy in the country where the potential global is around creating 475 million jobs right according to ilo where it is standing on you know five important pillars so indian government must be looking at firstly various uh, flexible amount of leave policies for the women 
subsidies for care services, investment in care infrastructure, skill training for care workers, and institutional mechanisms for quality assurance. Also, Japan as a country has focused on women womenomics, which is actually a very uh, you know slew amount of government policies to promote women at various sections of management levels in the country and also representing them in the labor force. Apart from this, Indian government must be promoting more and more public-private partnerships where the corporate sector, where the MSMEs, they can actually create a good ecosystem for care economy and monetize the same. Also. There are various economic segments of the silver economy, such as media, fashion, and tourism, cosmetics, finance, fitness, what not. So these are the areas where our startups can also focus on because going forward, this is actually a very important potential market for them. So the startups in the country, they can also be ensured or say encouraged to invest in the care economy. Now in this aspect, we have an 2023 PYQ from Mainz where we are asked to distinguish between care economy and monetized economy. And in the comment section, you give me two differences between what you think is care economy and what you think is monetized economy. And here, if you can look at this data also, these are the data you can use in your, say, answers, where if unpaid work was counted in India, the female labor force participation rate in the country would increase from around 20-30% right now to 81.7%. So can you imagine the potential of this care economy if we try to monetize it. So you write what you what is the main difference here and please be aware of this kind of topics and the kind of validation we, that we are trying to provide. In the next article, we'll be looking into the right to strike in India. And this is in context with reference to recent Indian port workers who have called off their strikes that they were conducting. It's a very important topic for UPC prelims for Indian polity and also for GS2 for Indian constitution and its evolution and its features. Now, when we talk about strikes, strikes are actually defined as collective refusal of employees or a section of population from any economic activity or from day-to-day -day activity. Just a simple example is that when workers find in a particular industry that that particular industry is very exploitative, it is paying very low wages, it is trying to overwork the people, so people can go to strike and they would generally form a trade union, union of workers and they would go to strike by totally refusing to do any work for one day, two day or any number of day that they feel like. And also we see that over a period of time in the recent news, only the last 24 hours, we see these four news articles where from the ports part, from say the lawyers, from doctors, even from political parties, there have been many instances of people calling for strikes. And we understand there are say worker rights that need to be protected. But also the main aspect or say the demerit of strike is that it can destabilize, it can destabilize an economy, right? Because it brings economy activities to an halt. Also, it develops a culture, culture of resorting to easy strikes whenever we find any kind of minor or even some in, in, in some issues, in some major issues, people go to strikes. So that is why strikes must be regulated. And also we have to understand in India, we had this Trade Union Act 1926. Can you in the comments tell me who was the governor general during this time? So during this particular time, this act was uh, you know uh, uh, established and the act gave some limited right to people to strike only to some registered trade unions. For the very first time in a country, we see the a country like US, there is this National Labor Relations Act of 1935, which recognized strikes by the workers. Also, Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948 recognized strikes to be a form of say collective labor action. ILO has recognized right to strike, but when we consider India's case, in India we have the right to protest, right? Protest can be of various issues, right? Industrial protest, social protest, any kind of protest, right? That is a fundamental right guaranteed under Article 19 of the Indian Constitution. But when it comes to right to strike, we do not have any fundamental right. We have a legal right under Industrial Relations Code of 2020, which was earlier known as Industrial Disputes Act of 1947. But we do not have any fundamental right in this particular right to strike. This was highlighted by various Supreme Court judgments in the past. Firstly, in the Kamalishwar Prasad 1958 case, Supreme Court clearly told that there is no fundamental right to strike. Government employees also have no legal, nor moral right to strike. Why? Legal, because 
government employees are actually a part of the government and you know they must not have any moral right because if they go to strike the entire economy not only economy but entire administration will come to halt and people will be suffering right delhi police versus union of india 1986 in it the supreme court clarified that there are various restrictions in article 19 which refers to freedom of association and the uh, supreme court interpreted that the right to strike is actually coming from freedom of association only and if freedom of association is having some restriction the same restrictions will be on the right to strike also and hence not a fundamental right again and in the tk Rangarajan versus government of Tamil Nadu, nine, uh, you know, so sorry, two thousand three. The employees of a particular, uh, say, company, they also have no fundamental rights to resort to strike, and the employees can be of a private company too. So these are all the important things that we need to know in this article. In the next article, we'll be looking into the various GST issues that is taking place in the country as of now, because the GST Council will be meeting next month to talk about some of the issues here. This is a very important article for UPSC prelims where we have to look into the inclusive growth aspects and also the government budgeting aspect of your means. Now we understand that GST is actually a uniform tax structure in the country, which is an indirect tax, which has subsumed the various taxes such as central taxes such as central excise duty, additional duty, service charge, countervailing duty, and this kind of aspects. Remember that this has been asked in means in the PYQs. And also, it has subsumed various state taxes such as state sales tax, purchase tax, entertainment, luxury lottery taxes, and so on. It has created a uniform structure, right? And also, it is trying to enlist. It is also trying to say ease the aspect of doing business in the country by having a proper GST portal, by eliminating the various cascading effects of various taxes, and also it is trying to increase the revenue from the government side. And in this particular aspect, it is also trying to bring down the overall prices because if the various taxes, as you can see here, this earlier system, this overall taxes used to create a cascading effect that there used to be a tax on tax on tax, and the prices would increase. And this GST is trying to reduce the prices over a period of time and hence bring competitiveness in the market and also is trying to streamline the entire tax collection in the country the dual structure is that we have a central gst we have a state gst also on the other side we have an integrated gst for interstate transactions apart from this we have a compensation says because when gst was implemented the state governments had to give up some of their taxes and the state government when they gave up their taxes they thought that they would be losing revenue say so they so they bargained with the center they actually talked about some kind of deal which is a deal where the center has to compensate with the to, to, to the states for the implementation of gst so that is levied on various luxury and same goods from the money collected here it is given to the state governments for the potential loss for the implementation of the gst and in the gst we uh, architecture we have a gst council which is having the union finance minister as a chairperson the union minister for state for revenue and the finance minister of all the states right and here the quorum of this particular council is half and the center is having one third of the vote the states collectively they are having two thirds of the votes in this council where the main function is that they will be recommending the gst rates the laws and the procedures they will be resolving disputes with reference to any gst aspect they will be also looking and deliberating on the gst compensation says the amount of the same and the finally about of distribution of the compensation says now recently we have find this uh, you, you have come across this issue of say uh, rate rationalization of the gst we know that in gst we have various slabs right we have 0% we have 5 12 18 and 28% now this is creating a confusion between various businesses right now there are various businesses in the entire country which they are calling for example this for example if a 5% uh, this particular structure they they can be brought into 8% structure 12% can be brought to 12 uh, say 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 15% right 28% and so on they can be brought to 30% or say we can actually have one rate at for example flat rate of 10% of gst on all items in the country so we understand that multiple amount of slabs sometimes bring out confusions but gom the group of ministers they recommended that the slabs must be kept unchanged and here this particular meeting which will be taking next month it will be looking into the impact what will be the 
aspect into the same next another issue on agenda is actually discussing on the unified payment system it is actually the amount of the various say gst aspects with reference to various merchants with reference to various shops with reference to various businesses dealing with reference to upi payments right the online payments and the various gst compliances associated with online payments and the cash payments also uh, uh, you know apart from this uh, with reference to this issue it is being expected that there would be again no changes in the next meeting but any changes in the gst rates or taxes will be impacting the ease of doing business right then also with reference to compensation says right the loan repayment structure the loan repayment structure or say the loan that the center has taken from the various sources to compensate the states with the various compensation says right it would be say looked into into this particular meeting right and also the government is finalizing that all of the loan payments will be done by next year ahead of 2026 which is the actual loan repayment date also the future of compensation says whether it will be extended beyond 25 26 it will be also decided at this particular say GST Council meet. So these are all the important aspects that you need to know in this article. Finally, we'll be looking at prelim snippets where we'll be starting with a very sad incident of another cheetah in India, which was who actually came from Namibia, who has died recently due to drowning allegations. Now here we need to look at various cheetah facts here. Right now we understand that this is one of the oldest cat species in the entire world and the ancestors can be traced back to around 8.5 million years ago. Right now we know that the you know cheetah in you know uh, all around the world they are classified under vulnerable species the asiatic cheetah and the north african cheetah are critically endangered right now cheetahs have lost 90 percent of the global habitat and we know that right now they live only in nine percent of their historical range so they're concentrated only in say various you know specific areas of south africa namibia areas of some uh, parts of africa and iran right so the main aspect of uh, this project cheetah is to reintroduce cheetah into our country again. In India, we have had cheetahs in the past, but due to excessive hunting, right, the cheetah's population totally were decimated. And that is why we thought of introducing cheetah from the rest of the world because already cheetahs used to live in our local areas, in local India. So that is why we thought that they can persist here, right? We uh, the main main aspect of cheetah uh, project cheetah is actually have to having habitat restoration of their earlier historic range such as the areas of Madhya Pradesh and so on where we started in reintroducing cheetah from South Africa and Namibia where we introduced them into the Kuno National Park. Now this national park is located in Madhya Pradesh and that is where the cheetahs were brought into and we have to monitor and research on how to increase their population in the country. Also, what efforts we must be taking more to conserve the bunch of cheetahs here. Also, right now we have seen that out of around 20 cheetahs which were bought, eight of the cheetahs have already died due to many issues, due to old age, due to various uh, kidney related issues, due to right now drowning issues. So there is a say concern right now that maybe that project cheetah was not based on total scientific foundations. So these are the various things that you need to know of. In the next one, we'll be looking into combination drugs because recently the government of India has bought some, some strict regulations on the combination drugs. These are fixed combination drugs which contain two or more uh, aggregate you know, pharmaceutical ingredients which are say for an example, say one drug, two plus three plus four, right? So this is actually a drug which is uh, 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 having a combination of drug which is also known as cocktail drug right and why these are actually done to actually have more and more, more and more efficiency of existing drugs or say they can improve the patient with reference to acceptance of drugs in their particular bodies right and also enhance the therapeutic efficiency in their bodies the main disadvantage is that they can pose risks such as increased side effects drug interactions with the body also it can lead to drug dose adjustment difficulties also anti microbial 
resistance or AMR where the microbial such as virus bacteria they become resistant to these kind of drugs right so the decisions on various fixed combination drugs they are generally taken by drug technical advisory board of India and here they have actually against ordered against the use of this and this is using against the section 26a of drug and cosmetics act 1940 which is actually looking into the manufacture sale of distribution of drugs in the country we will be looking into northern bod abyss because this is a bird species which is in the news in the Hindu. If you can see here, the main aspect is that we have to look into the conservation status that it is critically endangered and the main habitat of this kind of birds if we can see here is Middle East, North Africa with some populations in Turkey and Morocco. right? And their main characteristic is that they have large, long ibis, right, which are bored head and neck. They have red, brown plumage and a long curved bill as also as you can see from this image, right. The main threat that they are facing right now with, with reference to say habitat loss, hunting and disturbance with reference to their natural habitat. Their main conservation efforts that right now the government of the various countries here as you can see on this map is taking with reference to captive breeding program community outreach initiatives and so on finally we will be looking into national security guard which are also known as black cat commandos these are specialized counter terrorism units which were raised in for the very first time in 1984 just after operation blue star and after the assassination of the uh, then Prime Minister of the India, that is Indira Gandhi. The main purpose is counter-terrorism operations, hostage rescue, counter-hijacking and anti-sabotage activities. The structure is that, that, that there is, uh, they, they are a part of the Ministry of Home Affairs where they have five battalions. And the main operation, the main famous operation that they carried out is in the recent times is the Mumbai attacks against the terrorists in 2008 and the Pathan God attack of 2016. The, they also engage in international collaboration with the various agencies abroad, anti-terrorism agencies abroad. And the main command structure of this National Security Guard is headed by a Director General which who is actually a senior IPS officer. And their motto is Dhamma Dhamma Me Shorya which translates into valor in every vein. So these are all the articles that we need to discuss today. I thank you all for being a very patient audience. Please do attempt the quiz which is following up. Till again, all the best, best of luck.